Assalamu alaikum, peace be with you and welcome to Islam and Life with me, Tariq Ramadan, broadcasting from London. In today's show, we ask the question, how dangerous is the takfiri movement for Islam? According to experts, many takfiri groups have emerged in the Middle East and beyond. The main defining characteristic of these groups has been the targeting of innocent Muslims. In Syria, it's been reported the rise of Jabhat al-Nusra brought a wave of destruction and has spilled over into Lebanon with the declaration that the inhabitants of the Zahia region must be killed. Iraq experienced sectarian strife leading to a dire situation where thousands have either fled from their homes or been killed in terrorist attacks. In response, Tunisia's new constitution criminalizes the act of takfir. Political support in the Middle East by countries such as Saudi Arabia seem to be fueling the activities of takfiri groups. This week on Islam and Life, we ask, how dangerous is the takfiri movement for Islam? It's an important question. When we come to deal with Islam and Muslims around the world, we can see that there are different trends. And there is something which is an accepted diversity from the very origin of Islam, between the Sunni and the Shia, between different trends within the schools of law. These are things that are known and accepted by the scholars. What we had throughout our history and today is some groups that are uh, putting all the others outside the realm of Islam and by doing so, uh, giving themselves the way or the opportunity or the power to judge the people and to put them outside Islam. And this is what we call uh, the Takriri process. Over the last few years, we have seen this. In fact, not only the last few years, it's even before that. Uh, over the last uh, uh, 20 to f uh, 30 years, we have seen some groups coming and playing uh, uh, that game, that putting people within Islam or outside Islam. And what we, have, we are doing now and seeing now is these groups being very, very powerful in the way they are attracting some groups on the margin of Islam, but also uh, uh, targeting other Muslims and targeting people of other faiths. How do we have to understand what is the, the origin and what are the financial resources that these groups could have and which political uh, role are they playing on the ground in the Middle East and throughout the world? These are critical questions and to answer all these questions I'm joined by my guest uh, Paul Salahuddin Armstrong, uh, co-director for the Association of British Muslims. Uh, thank you uh, uh, so much for being with us. Let me start with a, a, a simple question because we are talking about takfir and takfiri movement, how would you define uh, the takfiri movement uh, throughout history and more recently, how would we uh, 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 get a, a, a right picture or the right picture when it comes to the takfiri movement? Well, the, the uh, sort of idea of takfir came about with uh, Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab, who was a preacher who lived in what is now Saudi Arabia a couple of hundred years ago. And the problem is, he, he saw what Muslims were doing around him and he thought, there's so many things that Muslims are doing which is wrong. And instead of just thinking that the Muslims were sinful, like anybody makes mistakes, like, you know? But instead of that, he decided to say, they're no longer Muslims. And then he decided to go even further and say, well, you know, because they're no longer Muslims, they are targets. Mm. And this is the mentality that his followers have taken since then. Now, when he was just an errant preacher in the middle of the desert, who was denounced by the scholars of all major schools of Islam of his time as a, as a, as a mad heretic, hmm. then he was no real danger to anyone. But the problem is, his, his followers worked uh, with the Saud family, who later on became the kings of the state of Saudi Arabia when it was founded. And they made the people of this particular uh, 
minhaj as they like to call themselves, they made them the official religion in the new state of Saudi Arabia. Even then, that would be dangerous, but it wouldn't be as dangerous as what they then did next. Because with the discovery of oil, they had a lot of money available. And they invested in spreading this ideology around the world by translating books into lots of different languages. But would you say, for example, that uh, because what you are saying could be, you know, in terms of history and the way we have to deal with history, uh, first, uh, Abdel Wahab was not very, he was more a Salafi than a Takfiri. We have some trends within the mm. Salafi that are putting people within and people outside. If you got his take, it was he was targeting superstition. He was targeting uh, what he called shirk, which is people, mm. uh, uh, in fact, uh, uh, being very, very uh, idealizing some of the leaders and the shiur and saying, this is not Islam. We have to come back to uh, Islam. What we had within is also people who, in fact, went very far in putting people within and putting people outside. So, oh, I, so I agree with you, Tariq. I mean, I'm not saying that all people who now call themselves Salafis hmm. or al hadith or groups like this today are all extremists. Hmm. Oh, by no means. I mean, I know scholars myself within these groups who are very sensible and they wouldn't go tack fearing anyone. Hmm. So it, this is very important to make that absolutely clear. Yeah, yes, exactly. And this is why I, I come it back. It did still emerge from within that movement. And it is an extreme wing of that movement that tends to be the worst in this kind of uh, approach to tack fear. But then what tended to happen is other groups have caught on. And you even see like Brovi Sunnis within Pakistan at the moment who are traditionally ala sunnah or jamaat, but there is an extreme wing among them who have gone down the takviri approach as well. So this is exactly you know. my point. What I wanted you to, to, to uh, 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 clarify is exactly what you are saying mm -hmm. now, that we can find takviri uh, movements within, in fact, many different schools. I think of within thought. all schools. I exactly. Mean, you know, and you've I got think that takviri elements within, within So my point that, is, yeah. how would you define uh, the takfiri mindset. If we look at uh, all the trends, we can see that, for example, even uh, within political Islam mm. in Egypt after, after the, 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 the 50s and the 60s and the 70s and the repression by mm. uh, uh, the dictators, we had people from within saying, we are the only Muslims and all these people are not. And even they call themselves al takfir wal hijra, meaning we are mm. the right Muslims and we have to exile, uh, to go into exile within our society. So even within political Islam, even within the Salafi and uh, mm. all the tradition, we see, we see this uh, uh, phenomenon. And this is very dangerous. It's very dangerous Absolutely. because behind yeah. it, there is a mindset. Would you define which type of mindset? How, how can we I think, end up being a tech theory? I think the most dangerous thing is, I mean, these people always talk about shirk. And of course, we should all be careful of shir doing shirk. Shirk, but which is associating anything. Any partners to, yeah, with God, you know, yeah. it's, it's seen as the greatest form of blasphemy. Hmm. But then they actually perform an even worse form of blasphemy. Because what these people actually do is they take out of the hands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the fact that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the judge. And that every one of us is going to have to stand before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on the day of Qiyamah and give an account for our actions. They take that out of the hands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and they judge themselves. They start to say that other people, without having full knowledge of that person's life and that person's intentions, and things that no human being can possibly have knowledge of, mm. and they then assume they know that person and then take fear them. Mm -hmm. And this is part of the mentality. They are actually the worst uh, people doing the form of shirt. They're the most. They're the worst form of blasphemers. Because and they because don't what is it. because what is important in what you are saying is that they end up being the judges for all the other people, speaking God's name in Allah's name, saying yeah. you are within Islam and this is the right way. So, so the first danger, in fact, is the theological legal danger of people judging others and putting them outside. Mm -hmm. And the second uh, uh, danger that we can see is what is happening within the Muslim societies and the Muslim majority mm -hmm. countries, which is also 
uh, uh, the reality of, of divisions that we have now. So, so if you look at what is happening now uh, in the Middle East and we look at, at these trends uh, in the clip, mm -hmm. uh, uh, the mention to Tunisia was made because what we saw after uh, the, the, the transitory period mm -hmm. is that people working from within the Tunisian society and, 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 and pushing very far uh, this mindset of uh, uh, dividing the Muslims as we are the right Muslims and you are the, you are the wrong, you are not real Muslims, you are not mm. truly Muslims. So what is the impact in the Middle East of these it's people? It's the oldest trick in the book, isn't mm. it? If you want to control people, you divide them and turn them against mm. each other so mm. that then you can come out on top afterwards and rule over them. Mm. I mean, anybody who's doing that, there should surely they're the most people that you keep an eye on and see what are they really about? Who's really backing them? You know, what's their real agenda? Mm. You know, the people so what that would, try to call be, together mm. are the ones that you, you don't worry about so much. Mm. Um, so what would be your answer? What is their real agenda behind this? Well, it's to divide and control the Muslims and uh, destroy the Muslims from within. Mm. I mean, Plato, many, many uh, centuries ago, he once uh, likened the whole state to uh, you know, a, a group of people. And he says that you have to be careful that you know you don't uh, basically you know if the state is like a group of people, then the diseases that can affect an individual can affect the whole state, and the, you know just like we've got nafs within us, you know it reminded me of that, and I thought yeah it's true you have to be careful of the enemy within the state that comes to you dressed in the, like Cicero said the, the enemy that comes to you dressed in the same clothes as you speaking the same tongue as you. And yet they're actually out to get you. They're out to stab you in the back at the easiest possible opportunity. Mm -hmm. um, that's what we have to be careful of. Yes, that, that's important because, in fact, when we listen to what they are saying, always referring to Al-Qur'an, to the prophetic traditions, mm -hmm. to Islam and the purified Islam as opposed to the distorted versions mm -hmm. of Islam that we have. And still what we can see on the ground is people, young people who sometimes are very sincere believers. The mm -hmm. problem is that they are very sincere in the, the way they understand and even in their conclusion and the judgments. Mm. But they are backed by people that are less sincere than them and playing a political game mm. in the region. And this is what we are seeing now. So, so if we have to resist such trends and these uh, uh, types of mindset, what should be the answer? Well, they play on people's ignorance. And this is uh, especially, you know, I mean, I've been told by a lot of these preachers of this way of thinking, don't use your uncle, don't use your brains. Who said? Where does this come from? The Quran appeals to us to use our brains. Hmm. And yet they tell us, don't use your brains. Well, of course, if you don't want, if you want to control someone, first thing you tell them is don't use their brains. Hmm. I mean, I was reading a book, uh, A Demon Haunted World by hmm. Carl Sagan. And in there, he mentions about uh, Frederick Bailey, who was a slave. And Frederick Bailey narrates his life uh, during the, the 1800s where you know, he was saying that the masters the, in America, in the Deep South, you know, Southern Baptist mm. types, they, they used to keep the uh, slaves ignorant because if you, if you educate the slaves, then you will liberate them, you will open their minds, you will spoil them in mm. their way of thinking. Mm. And of course, they don't want that. And that's how you keep people as slaves. Mm. And we have to wake up to this because Prophet Muhammad, says, um, I mean, these people talk about jihad, but Prophet Muhammad says, some's greatest jihad, his greatest struggle was against jahiliyyah. Mm. It was against ignorance. Mm. He wants to, people to open their minds to ikra, to read, read in the name of your Lord, who mm. taught through the use of the pen. Mm. We forget this. Mm. And it's returning back to this knowledge that we are supposed to learn. We are supposed to become educated people. That is part of being a good Muslim. And when we know stuff, then we're also supposed to help with the people around us learn as well. Hmm. I mean, so, so you would say that the first resistance uh, to this danger is to educate the followers. Education, very yes. much so. Yes. yes, but what about the, the, the leadership? Because when you are saying it's all about ignorance, uh, I met some of the people. I myself was facing people putting me outside of Islam, saying Tariq mm. Ramadan is kafir murtad, meaning, you know, I'm an, uh, 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 a non-believer and um, I, I, I went towards... Myself, yeah. Yes, yeah. you are, you know, you uh, an apostate in the mm. way. So, and the people who are saying this are not only ignorant followers, they are sometimes knowledgeable leaders. So, 
facing this discourse, while I completely agree with you, mm. educating the followers is, is critical. This is mm. what we have to do. Mm. Now, which type of uh, uh, resistance or uh, proactive or commitment uh, do, we, do we need to have when it comes to the less ignorant and sometimes more sophisticated leaders? What, you know, if you've got, just because someone's in a position of leadership doesn't necessarily mean that they are as knowledgeable as they claim or that they have the some right to the, the authority mm. that they claim. Well, yeah, but I mean, I've met people who've been to university who have, you know, degrees in this and that, but when you actually talk to them, the knowledge hasn't been digested. It hasn't mm. really been absorbed. Mm. And they can't defend their positions on things. So, I mean, if this is people who left university, then, you know, are we surprised that that's the case of some of the people that claim to be imams do you, do you think it's only do you, do you think it's only a question of knowledge and education? Sometimes it's a question of power. They are in a position of power. What is happening now in many Muslim-majority countries with these people working from within mm. is just to divide. But, but to do what? To get some power. To have the power uh, or, or the credit. It's yeah. politics. I mean, so who, who, who how gave you some priesthood? Hmm. You know, it, I, I never heard anything in the Prophet Sallallahu teachings in the Hadith or in the Quran where he says, and after me there shall be a class of priests. Hmm. He said scholars, hmm. scholars, knowledgeable people. And they are respected according to their level of learning, according to their level of knowledge and wisdom and how they behave towards people. Hmm. If they've got no adab and they're not respectful and, you know, they, they're saying very bad things, it doesn't matter, even if they've studied for how many years. How can we possibly that's my, follow that's such my, people? My question, my question is, is okay, you can just say they may have you know, some knowledge. The fact that they don't understand uh, uh, makes them quite ignorant about the whole situation. Yeah. Now, uh, what we see on the ground, and this is something which is, you know, the title of our program is really how dangerous mm. uh, is this. And it is very dangerous. Mm. So when you have to face the leadership of people who might be, once again, they are not all ignorant, some are quite sophisticated, but they have to do with politics and power. They want to get this credibility and the authoritative voice for Islam within the Muslim uh, mm. uh, majority, uh, uh, the Muslim majority societies or the Muslim communities. How are you going to challenge them? How are you going to challenge the leadership? What is missing sometimes? Coming from the leadership is, we think about the followers, sometimes we blame the followers, and we are not always uh, able to challenge the leadership. Well, there needs to be some form of accountability introduced, doesn't mm. there? Mm. And if people are in positions that they are respected as whatever, you know, th those positions should be based upon you know, just like any, anything, we've got like, uh, in this country, we've got various offices that check people, you know, Ofsted and Ofcom and whatnot. And if people go outside of regulations, well, these people should be regulated too. Hmm. And I mean, if they're, if they're stepping how? out of how? line... How? What do you mean exactly, regulated? How? How can we do that? Well, you know, Islam is not just a responsibility of the leadership. Each one of us has a responsibility on the ground. And hmm. we need to empower young, constructive people to actually play their part in taking things forward. Hmm. We can't just rely on people who are already there, especially when they've been there for a very long time and they could have done stuff and they haven't done stuff. Mm -hmm. And no disrespect to, of course, the individuals who have. Mm -hmm. we, we need to work with those who are doing positive and you know, constructive work. Mm -hmm. But there is also something else. You mentioned this at the beginning, which is sometimes within the Muslim communities or the Muslim majority countries among mm -hmm. Muslims, in the name of this unity, we have some Muslims being scared to speak out and to say things that are important. Mm. What we have today is we have some governments from behind the scene who are playing with some of the groups mm. to protect their own political interests. And this is something that is quite clear. We know about uh, 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 mm. Gulf states, we know about even within the, the situation, we know even that some of these trends are helped from outside by the West in order to divide the Muslims. So at one point, is it not high time for Muslim scholars or Muslim individuals to be much more courageous and being able to say, look, we have a problem here. And the problem is uh, the reading of the scriptural sources, the, mm -hmm. the understanding of the scriptural sources, but the political use uh, of some trends to divide the Muslims and 
at the end to get these divisions that is not uh, uh, helping us at all. Don't we have to be more courageous on that? Absolutely. I mean, I advise people to, along very similar lines myself. Mm. So, you know, I, I agree with that point very strongly. And, uh, you know, this is why we have to educate and empower people so that they're given the tools to be able to do that. Because how can they confront people who, you know, they know the Quran, they know the Hadith, they're misusing them, but they, they know them. Uh, how can we confront them unless we have that knowledge as a tool base to be able to confront them with mm -hmm. something? And, and then on the political side, what should be the role of, for example, you know, British Muslims who are mm. uh, working in a Muslim uh, organization in Britain? Mm. Uh, uh, it's as if, once again, what we see now is that for years we thought that this is only in the Middle East. Now we see some takfiri trends, even in the West. Mm. So, so what should be the role of the, 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 the Muslims around the world, wherever they are when it comes to this? Well, each of us has a responsibility over those people that we can influence and over those communities in which we live. So we have a responsibility. What that means is a duty upon each of us to do what we can to do positive work. Uh, we shouldn't be laying, ba laying back and doing nothing or you know, just uh, watching the football or whatnot. We have to get, out, get active and do something. And it's no good blaming others. Each of us has to do something ourselves. Um, and when you get a group of people, bring people together who are constructive and, and working on positive aims and network people together across different groups as well, people from different backgrounds. You know, just because people from a different school of thought, work with them. You know, it, even if you disagree on some things, at least if you've got some common ground. The Quran tells us that if we're with Jews and Christians, that we should come to a common understanding with them and recognize that at the end of the day, <laughs> we worship the same God and, you know, we should, because of this, we, we have common understanding of virtue and principles that we should therefore come together and understand and work with each other. So if that's what we're supposed to do with the Jews and Christians, should we not do more effort when it comes to the Muslims? The Quran also says that uh, Allah is the rope that, uh, you know, yeah, we should basically hold on to the rope of Allah and not be divided. Hmm. So it's there in the Quran. People need to return back to the Quran, understand the Quran. Hmm. And that's the answer. Thank you so much. I think that uh, uh, listening to, to you and, and, and the whole picture is quite important because uh, it's not only a religious discussion, it's a political discussion. And what you said at the beginning, we have to deal with the ignorance and we have to deal with uh, uh, people who have no uh, deep understanding. So the first reaction to this is also education, also to deal with the leadership by being more courageous and understanding the mindset behind, which is also people uh, misunderstanding the very openness of Islam by saying we are the only true mm. Muslims and you are not. And with this understanding, there is something here which is uh, 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 quite problematic and it's dangerous. It's dangerous because at the end it divides the Muslims and it's instrumentalized on the political, uh, from the political side and, and sometimes within the geostrategic realities in the Middle East and, and the Muslims are not coming together on that. Uh, well, that's all we have time for. Please let us know your thoughts and views on any of the shows you have seen. And here is the way to contact us. We at Islam and Life would like to hear your views about the subjects that we discuss. We would also love to hear your suggestions for our program. So get in touch with us. You can also share your thoughts with other Islam and Life fans, engage in debate and find out how to watch our previous shows. Follow us on Twitter at Islam and Life TV or join us on Facebook by liking our page Islam and Life on Press TV. Finally, I would like to thank my guest, Paul Salahuddin Armstrong. Thank you so much for your presence and your insight. And I hope to see you next week, inshallah. <laughs>